I'm Austin Lugo. I'm Andrew Harp. This is With Nothing to Say. Let's talk about heat. Before we get into today's episode, a special announcement. Next week, we'll be watching Pink Floyd's The Wall, but we'll be having a special guest for the next four episodes. That is Shannon Mitchell. Shannon Mitchell has been our editor for something around six months now. They have some good taste in some movies. We're going to be doing a month of musical-esque things. I'm pretty excited about it. Andrew, are you excited? Yeah. All right, let's get into it. Today we're talking about Heat. Andrew, you chose this movie. Why did you choose Heat? Yup, yep. 1995's Heat, directed by Chicago, writer, producer, director, Michael Mann. One of my favorite movies. We wanted to pick an action movie, something from the 90s. Um, and this is one of the greatest movies ever made. Um, it legitimately is. Like, you know, I, I mm-hmm. you know, <clears throat> it's a movie that I, I I watched when I was in college for the first time, and it didn't really I didn't really move me or affect me all that much, but I knew it was really good. And then in the past couple of years, I've been really getting into the movies of Michael Mann, who I think is one of the greatest directors working today, if not ever. Um, absolutely spectacular. Um, we've talked about it many. I've talked about it many times on the show on our uh, Patreon episodes. And um, this is considered his most famous movie. And I do think it's his best movie. Um, you know, it's just, I don't know. It's, uh, like I said, I, I, I've watched this movie a, a few times over the past couple of years. Actually, I think I've seen it maybe like two or three times over the past couple of years. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, just every watch, I'm just more just connected to it. And it's unbelievable. Um, um, I guess, Austin, what is Heat really about, I guess, from a plot standpoint? So Heat has a lot of moving parts into it. It has a lot of character involvement. There's a lot of shit going on. But at its core, you got this guy, Robert De Niro. He's been a criminal for like... 40, 50 years. Yeah, Neil. Mm -hmm. And he's just kind of like your creme de la creme of criminals. I mean, he just, like, he knows exactly what he wants. He's kind of always been on top. He never gets caught. He just, he's the best that there ever was. You know, he's he's really just the best that there can be. And then you got this guy, Al Pacino, and he's a cop. He doesn't follow the rules. He's, you know, smarter than everybody. also good. He's like a super detective. He's like a Sherlock Holmes of sorts, but he's also like almost all the characters in this movie, not a very good person. There's not a lot of people in this movie that are good people. Everyone's very complicated. The only person, the only person I would say that's actually good is uh, the Robert De Niro love interest. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, we could say that. She's fine. I mean, she's not in very much the movie, so it's kind of hard to say. Mm -hmm. what her motives are but hypothetically she seems like a nice person no she seems fine and she was like led astray by robert de niro as well like she doesn't really know that's true close to the end that robert de niro is uh i don't think anyone in the movie is bad i think everybody in the movie is just kind of like uh complicated Mm -hmm. they all have their desires um every single character has their own wants and desires um but their wants and desires are indicative of other people's wants and desires. So therefore they clash with each other and they do really Mm -hmm. fucked up shit in the process. Yeah. They're extremely complicated characters that I guess the best way to put it is that their wants are often contradictory to what they need. So, you know, Al Pacino, he wants to be, this super cop who catches all of the criminals. But by doing that, he's 
basically ruined his entire life. And that's true with basically most of the characters in this film. And that's kind even of Al Pacino. Like from... What? Even Al Pacino, it kind of ruins his yeah, life. Even exactly. though he's a, he, yeah, he's a cop. Yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah, that's, you know, those two characters are amazing. You know, they're, they're different, but they're also similar um, in many different kinds of ways. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So kind of getting into the the film itself, as we were, Mm. the opening (laughs) is just insane. I love it so much. It's so... One of the greatest openings ever. Even the opening shot of the train looks amazing. I love the opening shot. (laughs) When they're on the tracks and it's just like a train coming towards... Yeah, I don't know. It's just like a really beautiful shot. (laughs) It looks great. I mean, so much this film just... The gaffing on this film is just spectacular. I mean, there's some just really great lighting setups, especially for outdoor night setups, which can be very hard to light at times. And it looks spectacular. It's very, it's very, it's a very blue movie. The whole mm-hmm. movie is very blue, very blue tinted. Looks great. Absolutely. But that opening scene, Robert De Niro's just like he walks into a hospital and no one gives mm-hmm. a shit about Robert De Niro because he's just like your average looking guy, I guess. And he just goes in and steals an ambulance. And the cutting of this scene and the whole whole film, honestly, it's incredible. I mean, it's perfect. I'm not someone who often talks about editing because it's something that I've never been very good at. And it's something that I probably notice the least of things when I'm watching a film. But I mean, the editing of this is just on point every single second. It just moves so quickly, so fast. Even like the smallest little things, like even though all that happens in this opening scene is like Robert De Niro walks into a hospital and then he steals an ambulance, but there's no like conflict. Like he basically just walks through a hospital. It's very simple. Yeah. And yet it feels like so intense. Like you're just like, oh shit, like you have no idea what's going to happen. And it's like that the whole film, like it's just this insane pace that just keeps up and just goes and goes and goes and goes. Yep. Yep. And, and basically what you're describing is kind of the build up build up of the basically the ensuing incident where Robert De Niro, Neil, and his buds, um, which are all in, you're you're introduced to all of them, um, are uh are uh, getting together to um uh basically uh rob uh like a bank truck. Um and basically what they're gonna do is that um we can stop for a second if you want. Yeah let's take the pause. What love? What are you talking about? We're doing the podcast. Oh, I thought you did that yesterday. Sorry. <laughs> I thought you guys were just gabbing. No, not oh. right now. The guy come to fix the sink? No. Really? Yeah. Why? I don't know why no one came. <laughs> the sons of bitches. Yeah. Okay. Well, all right. <laughs> No, we just started. <laughs> Exciting news. Hey, you can tell me later. All right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Basically, what you're describing is like kind of like the ensuing incident of the movie where Robert De Niro and his buds, who you're all introduced with, um, rob an armored car. And yeah, like you said, the way that like everything is set up, you know, there's one guy, he's driving a big truck. Okay, what is he going to mm-hmm. do with the big truck? There's the ambulance. Okay, what are they going to do with the ambulance? This is interesting. And um, one of the guys that they pick up, is, one of the guys in the crew is this new guy they hired named Wayne Grow, who's kind of like, mm-hmm. uh, like you said, like kind of like a cog in kind of the whole thing that yeah. the whole story kind of, he's like kind of like a wild card while the rest of the guys, um, Neil, trusts um, and likes a lot. And what they do is that they, as this armored car is going down the street, they stop it with the ambulance. Mm-hmm. And then the guy in the big armored truck speed at the armored car and they hit it and it fucking rolls over and knocks into a bunch of other cars. Looks great. It's incredible. I love it. It's such a well thought out scene. And I think one of the things that I love about this film, and we'll probably talk about this a lot, is just how smart Neil is and just like how he knows exactly what's going to happen and just like how well thought out these 
crimes are. It reminds me a lot of, and I think I compare now every bank robbing movie with the the Friends of Eddie Quayle because that to me that's kind of like top tier bank robbing. That like that's, really good. I mean, to me, it's like one of the best that there ever was. And this has a similar like, you know, Michael Mann sat down with, you know, he didn't write it right. Someone else wrote it. No, he wrote it. He wrote it. Okay, yeah. So he yeah, sat no, down. Michael Mann. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Continue. Sorry. Yeah. So he sat down and like just you can tell he put so much thought into every every single detail of this film down to how the heist would work, what would happen to heist. I mean, there's just like so many little things. It's almost yeah. It almost works as kind of a film noir in many sense because there's like these little hints they drop. And of course, like Al Pacino's thing, I mean, he is a detective and he's going to find these things, but like you can kind of figure it out on your own as it's going. And it's just so mm-hmm. incredible. Have you yeah, ever Michael seen Man. Ra- Yeah. 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 What were you saying? Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. I was going to ask, have you ever seen Wrath of Man, the like 2018 Guy Ritchie film? I think that came out like a year or two ago and I have not. The opening is the same. It's the exact same opening. They do the exact same thing. It's literally the same heist. Well, another fucking movie that like basically jacks this movie, which is fine because it's a great movie. And if you jack from it, is, is of course The Dark Knight. That one, that movie is mm-hmm. probably the movie that probably rips off the, this movie the most, you know. And Dark Knight's a great movie. I love it. Um, but yeah, like all like the like the, kind of like the realistic kind of like gritty violence and stuff, yeah. and like the scene in the beginning of the Dark Knight reminds me of scenes in this movie. Um, all the car chase scenes into Dark Knight kind of remind me of Heat as well. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. no, there's a lot of like movies that uh, <laughs> are uh, heavily influenced by this movie <laughs> um, if you look hard enough. Um, yeah, and it's a very realistic movie too. It feels very, very real. All the shootouts mm-hmm. are very real. Oh yeah, all the car stuff it feels really real. Um, you know, it's just all real shit. And the other thing too, like you said, like Michael Mann, like he's like uh, one thing about Michael Mann is I learned is that like he's a he is a meticulous um, director and researcher, and so mm-hmm. a lot of so not everything, but like I think at least a few things from the movie are um, more inspired by. Um, Detective Chuck Adamson, who was like a detective who worked a long time in Chicago, um, mm-hmm. and uh, and it's um, Heat is kind of based on the true story of this guy named Neil McCauley, who is a criminal and ex Alcatraz inmate, um, who added who Adamson tracked down. So there's a lot of things in the movie that are um, taken from Adamson's experience trying to uh, get McCauley. Um, conversations different heists um there's i think it's a surprising amount of stuff that man kind of takes from real life Mm -hmm. um and uses in the movie which just just goes to show you how like i said meticulous like man is as a researcher in finding actual people and using their experiences um to make the movie real but i think but the movie as real as the movie is the reason why I like Michael Mann is that he's able to kind of like his movies. The reason why I love his movies and why I love this movie a lot is that it's not just like a gritty, realistic movie. There's something about it that's very romantic that feels very uplifted as if it, it it's kind of what cinema is all about, right? It kind of takes real life situations and real life feelings, und- indescribable events, and he's able to like lift them up a little bit in a way in which um, it feels almost unreal, almost kind of like in a spiritual kind of sense. Um, I mean, that's why Michael Mann is so good, and that's why this movie is so fucking good. Yeah, I cannot disagree on any sense. I think I usually have a problem with kind of action films. We've talked about a couple action films on the podcast before. We haven't done a ton of them. I think part of it is because I've just never really been drawn to him. I mean, when I was a kid, I kind of was, but I don't know. There was something all about him that is a little silly. I mean, you know, as much as we talked about Die Hard and I certainly enjoyed that film. It's at the end of the day, it's it's kind of a ridiculous film. Like, you know, one cop going up against like 10 terrorists and it, it's kind of a ridiculous premise. But what I love about Heat not only is it 
incredibly well researched, as you said, and just so well thought out. But these feel like very real people. And this feels like a very real world in which these events could actually happen. Like you genuinely believe that Robert De Niro is just this long time thief, I guess. And Al Pacino is just this hardened cop. And it's incredible. I mean, I'm just yeah, yeah. so drawn. And it's, I mean, of course, you know, when you talk to Nero, Al Pacino, Val Kilmer, so many incredible performances here. But yeah, honestly, cast, I yeah. think I think this is one of De Niro's best performances. Like, I know he doesn't really isn't good. given like a lot of range in this film. Like, there's not mm-hmm. you know crying and laughing. It's certainly not kind of like one of his more absurd performances, like Raging Bull, right? Which is kind of all over the place. Mm-hmm. But I think there's something more incredible about the fact that through almost the whole film he's kind of like cold calm cool and collected and so like so yeah. much of that energy kind of has to go into like those tiny little micro movements and you can see that yeah, and it is whenever you watch yeah, it he's so good mm-hmm. yeah he's really good and we'll talk about some of those moments later on like i have like a favorite of mine when it comes to that as well i like al pacino too you know al pacino he uh he, he's like hyper in the movie and he has a lot of like amazing lines in the movie he's so like really fucking lines. funny yeah he has some of the best lines of all time um but yeah i mean we'll go over that too of course um yeah he's really really funny uh, apparently like a detail that they included in like the lore of the character but that they didn't actually explicitly say in the movie is that mm-hmm. like they they i guess i guess like one thing that kind of like wrote about al pacino's character vincent is that um he does like a little bit of cocaine like he kind of swipes a little bit and he does I can it see that. yeah um but they don't explicitly <laughs> reference it which is fine with me like it's just he's just mm-hmm. kind of like i think it's fine either way whether he's hyper he's like kind of a crazy hyper guy when he's working or if he does cocaine you know it doesn't really matter either way for me right but yeah he's like a good character and he's good you know like they 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 bounce off each other well um in the scenes where they do interact with each other um which is like they're few and far between i love when they interact with each other whether directly or indirectly um, mm-hmm. I find that interesting. Um, but yeah, like we said, like, um, you know, at the end of the day, too, like, Heat is like a crime drama movie. It's a crime drama, but it has some action scenes in it that are some of the greatest action scenes ever made. I mean, ever filmed, and including this opening one, too, where, you know, they destroy the truck, they get in, they steal $1.6 million in bear bonds, mm-hmm. and they have like three hostages. And I love the scene where wing grow. They they all have like these kind of like these big like I guess they're hockey masks. Ski masks? They don't. Yeah. Ski masks. They're, they're like the plastic ones mm-hmm. with the holes in it. Yeah, they look crazy. Um, they look really scary. And uh, yeah, they uh, they they um and wing grow like who said who's the wild card guy, the new guy. He he gets testy because this this cop is like staring. I love that scene where like I love that shot where the cop is like staring at him and it kind yeah. of zooms in on him kind of. And Wayne Grove gets like testy and he sh- shoots and kills him. And then he kills another cop and they're like, oh shit. And of course, during all, all this time, you know, they're timing themselves because they like know exactly when the cops will arrive because they're mm-hmm. professionals and yeah. And then they are just like, well, there's one guy left, <laughs> you know, like two out of the three guys are died. I mean, like, what's the use of leaving another guy? So they kill him too. Very violent. Uh, very yeah. real it really feels it really seems like they shoot a guy with a machine gun um and they get away they sure do yeah all of so, the shootouts i guess you could call them feel very real i mean we'll get into like some really incredible shootouts later obviously this is more yeah, just... the one big one the one big yeah. one later on which is kind of the <laughs> yeah but i mean even early on like the way kind of people like move when they're shot or like the way that you can't hear like at all. Like I love, I mean, with that shot with like the police officer, it's like the super wide lens. They kind of do like this dolly zoom thing with him and just like the whole sound design of the whole scene. And of course the whole time you have like the background of like, you know, you have three minutes and it's just like tick, 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 you know, just going and going, going. And it's just so succinct. It's absolutely incredible. Yeah. Super fucking good. And then of course, you know, after that, um <clears throat> you get the great scene of course where you're introduced to vincent al pacino and he and his crew you get to know that their crew too you know him and his you know group of cops they're in on the case 
And I love it too, how they break down how like genius, like the setup was and how professional and quick they were. And I just love mm-hmm. that because they're really good too. You know, they're able to understand like what who they're kind of dealing with right away. Um, and then after that, you know, you, like I said, the movie's great because you really get into the lives of all, almost all the characters, um, yeah. including Al Pacino, uh, Vincent, you know, you learn about his relationship with his wife his uh, stepdaughter natalie portman um, natalie portman who's probably the weakest performance i'm not i don't really care much for her as she's an actor. like 12 years old so yeah she's 12 she's years kid. old well i mean God. like she was in leon and she's probably younger in that movie um, yeah i think leon was first but her character is fine just because like once again that's like kind of like another complicated element to mm-hmm. vincent's life you know and he and his wife like his wife is just like mad at him all the time because he is just always out doing his job, um, which is a very violent and um, difficult, hard to swallow job. So that they kind of like butt heads. Um, and then you also get Macaulay, um, who is alone. You know, he lives like in a really nice house, um, but he doesn't have like a wife or kids or anything like that. Like he's a very lonely guy. Um, and but he meets someone, uh, Edie. Um, and they begin a relationship. Yeah. The opening scene with Edie is an incredible meet cue <laughs> because sure. Robert De Niro, as he says many times this film, and I'm going to fuck up the quote, but it's a really great quote. So I haven't seen me. the film. Oh, can you read the quote that he says? Yeah, he says he yeah, had, he <clears throat> the great thing about Macaulay as a character is that he has like kind of he's very dogmatic. And one of his mm-hmm. things was like, allow nothing to be in your life that you cannot walk out in 30 seconds flat if you spot the heat around the corner. So he's basically just saying, like, you know, like, why tie yourself to anything if you do what I do? You know, because it's just gonna get like killed or ruined or destroyed. So he doesn't have like a girlfriend or a wife or anything like that. But he kind of sort of his desires put him in a different direction as dogmatic as he he is he kind of does he kind of goes against it by pursuing this relationship with Edie yeah absolutely Edie's his femme fatale in many ways of course she doesn't do anything wrong but it's his own desire to not be alone anymore to be with someone to be with her and that opening scene where (laughs) where he's like reading this metals book. Cause again, he's a guy who just, he really fucking does his research. Like he really cares about yeah, he's the really thieving that he does. he does. That's kind of like a common theme of, among Michael Mann movies, by the way, where you mm-hmm. have guys who are really good at what they do. And he's very interested in that. I love it. And he's like reading this metals book and she's just being polite. She asks him some questions. And of course, like at first he's just like, fuck off and you know, all that shit. He doesn't trust right away. He's just like, who, like, you know, I don't trust. Why would I trust a person who's interested in me like this? It's great. But they hit it off. Yep. They have a relationship. Yeah. And he really, really likes her. Once again, you know, it's kind of, it's sort of, you know, kind of going against his dogmatic principles. Um, but it is very interesting and it's very romantic. It really is. You know, it really is kind of, he, he, he kind of, you know, Macaulay and that performance by De Niro of Macaulay being in love is very interesting. Um, and Edie almost kind of represents kind of like this hopeful thing for Macaulay as well, you know. Um, but of course, that changes by the end of the movie, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I, I like the, um, the scheme that they put together uh, with John Voight. Mm-hmm. John Voight and Macaulay, they talk, and John Voight's basically just like, yeah, you stole all these bear bonds from this guy named Van Zant, who's like a money launderer for drugs. Um, so you can just, so you can just make a deal with him where he gets all the insurance money, but then you sell it to him at a discount. Um, so that he, uh, like, so it'd be a good deal for him. And Van Zant's like, okay, we'll do it. But he's just like, nah, I'm mad at them. I'm going to kill them. <laughs> like, he gets, like, really, like, mad at the fact that they stole from him, even though he would probably make more money in the long run. 
because yeah. he's get the hundred percent. He gets like the insurance, but he also gets his bear bonds back. And then he gets bear bonds really at like forty percent. Yeah. Yeah. What a another just incredible and really thoughtful plot point. And I think the reason people so often choose sort of bank robbers or these kind of thieves as protagonists of films it and robert de niro actually says this at some point in the film is that i mean if they're not killing anybody if they don't hurt anyone like they're really not the bad guys because they're not stealing from individuals they're either stealing for like million or billion dollar companies or they're stealing from the federal government which you know but, i mean i guess they do, it's yeah, great they do kill people <laughs> they do kill people so not perfect but you know like it's better than like a serial killer like you know they do the thing where they yeah they do the thing where they uh, rob the bank and and uh, robert and, and mccauley says like we're not stealing your money your money's insured like we're stealing from the bank or whatever mm-hmm. and uh and the michael mann movie public enemies with john dillinger john dillinger basically says the same thing when he robs a bank <laughs> he's just like we're not stealing from you you guys your money will be fine it's insured we're stealing money from the bank you know so yeah. don't do anything like really <laughs> stupid but we'll get to the bank robbery scene. Um, you have the ensuing scene, of course, where they're going to make the, uh, they, they um, are going to ambush and try to kill Macaulay, but that goes totally haywire. They're at that like abandoned movie theater. Yeah. Uh, uh, outdoor. It's like a theater. drive-in. Yeah, drive-in. Yeah. yeah. Drive-in. And that totally goes wrong. That's a nice little action scene. What an incredible, With, like, just the, another the incredible car, scene. Like, bumping up and down. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Again, just one of those scenes where not a lot happens there's very little dialogue but just like the movements of everything and again just going back to the editing you know you see them hand over the package you see someone step out of the car you see them moving towards you see uh you know the little earpiece that robert de niro has and you see the sniper and kind of you know and then of course like the part where he like basically runs the guy over and that whole shootout scene yeah yeah it's great (laughs) it's good (laughs) And then, and then after that too, there's so many good moments in the movie, dude. The moment too, where like Macaulay, he calls Van Sant and he's like, I'm talking, I'm talking to an empty phone. You know, such a good so ass. many great lines. So many good lines. That's a good, that's probably the best Macaulay line in the movie. Um, Cause like, I'm talking, I'm talking to a dead man. It hangs up. <laughs> it's so good. Um, at the same time, Wayne Grow. Oh, we yeah earlier in the movie Wangro gets away because they're gonna kill him because he fucked up the um the armored car robbery but he he disappears yeah. and when he disappears he starts like killing prostitutes he um, sure so does that's like another that's another thing that <laughs> Vincent has to deal with as well uh and uh no one's no one in the movie is really evil but Wangro is probably the most evil character in the movie oh yeah um, for sure he's the I guess the guy who doesn't give a shit about anything like I guess like every I guess like all the characters are kind of like on a spectrum you might say and mm-hmm. like Wayne grows all the way on, over on the evil side evil you know killing people killing prostitutes I would say that's evil <laughs> um so yeah like Vincent has to deal with that um and yeah there's just a lot of crazy things and I think like the next big scene is when they're um they are monitoring um the LAPD the cops are monitoring um Macaulay try to break into the precious metals place um where they're in the uh truck yeah that's a good scene yeah the whole time you kind of see this juxtaposition of Macaulay and Vincent where Macaulay is calm cool and collected he's kind of just always there he's just very emotionless i guess and of course vince it's kind of the opposite end of the spectrum he's absolutely crazy he's insane every time you very, see him, but they're both very good and professional what they do yeah they're the i mean they they're the results. best at what they do absolutely and you know as we'll talk about later when <clears throat> they actually meet up in person they're a lot more similar than they are different and i think that's kind of one of the big conflicts of kind of facing themselves is the fact that they are so similar but the way I guess they express it is very different. So Vincent's, you know, just very all over the place. And you see him, you know, meet with CIs and you see him meet with uh, kind of the criminal underground. Like he kind of, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. He kind of sh- gets information by schmoozing yeah. with them and giving them making deals and stuff. Yeah, which and is not like yeah. you wouldn't want a cop to do that, but he's just kind of like he he's kind of making calculations in his head, like okay, I'll give up this, but I get to get mm-hmm. this, and these are the because these are the guys I actually want. Yeah, absolutely. And just those conversations every time he's <laughs> meeting with any sort of criminal, I love yeah. how yeah, even though crazy. like he should be, and in like most situations, typically. You know, when you think of like a procedural cop film or whatever, like yeah. typically the bad guy, the villain, the uh, I, the criminal has the upper hand, right? They're like all masculine and macho. And every yeah, single yeah, scene yeah. Vincent's in, he's just like, everyone is so always terrified has the of upper him. Hand. Yeah. <laughs> he is always like, he's not like scared at all. He's Great. so good. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Yeah, he Vincent is always like when it comes to almost all other people that he deals with, he's just so like, uh, yeah, he's like kind of scary to everyone. Everyone's like, like man, like they kind of like they try to run a, run around on him, you know, like mm-hmm. if they ask him to do something, um, because they're kind of like wrapped around his finger, you know. Yeah. But yeah, all yeah, those parts are so fucking good. <laughs> yeah, so many so many good lines, which just like him, just like. You know, talking to like criminals and stuff. It's so fucking funny. Yeah. <laughs> it's so it's good. good. But kind of as you were saying, kind of getting back into it, he's basically figured out that one of the people, Slick, or the one that calls everyone Slick, uh, the, the evilest of the people, has kind Wonder? of... Yeah, Wayne Grow. Like that's how he kind of figures everyone out. Cause, cause first he figures out that the, cause when he's at like the club, the guy mentions Wayne Grow, not specifically, yeah. and so that's how he figures out like one of the other people, and then kind of slowly kind of gets in, and that's how he figures out who everyone mm-hmm. is, and that's how they figure out who Macaulay is, and then of course you have the. I don't think I don't think they find out about Wayne Grow first. I think they find out about the Tom Sizemore character first. He's the guy when they're fucking up Wayne Grow. There's like a guy who like looks up from his menu and looks over at the table, and Tom Size mm. looks over like this. I think they find out about him first. Yeah. Before they find out about Wayne Grow. Right. Right. You're right. I mean, you've seen this movie many more times than I have. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, it's just like a stupid little detail. But yeah, you're right. Like, Vincent is slowly figuring out who these people are. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, that scene we were kind of jumping into where there's dealing metal or something like that i love yeah, they got a big drill when they're watching the criminals whenever you see the kind of lapd together especially when vincent's there like he just like you know here's all the information we have on this guy here's all the information we have. like it's a great way to add <clears throat> what's the word i'm looking for uh, I can't remember the word. It's damn. That's gonna bother me. It starts with a P. Uh, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I'll I'll probably remember it later. <laughs> Anyways, it's a great way to give information without like having to tell the audience. Like it's a very intelligent way to kind of you know explain. Here's especially because in yeah. a film like this, that's like three hours long. And there's tons and tons of characters. And Michael Mann is very interested in the lives of all these different characters. So there's just a shit ton of stuff going on. And I certainly, there were times where I was trying to figure out, okay, how is this person connected to that person and so on and so forth. But those kind of moments kind of bring everything together. And you're like, oh, right, right, right. This person's connected to this person and that person's connected to that person. And they're watching this scene go down. And, you know, they're about to steal the medals. And Robert De Niro basically through instinct i mean i guess he kind no, of he, hears he, like he someone hears sit them. down yeah. yeah he hears someone yeah he hears like a guy like knock his like rifle against like the metal wall um and they have that moment that great moment where vincent is looking at the video screen of um like the infrared infrared version oh my god it's so terrifying and he, they're like almost like staring at each other but they're yeah. not, you know they're not really staring at each other but they almost they basically are and then mm-hmm. mccauley is just like nope we walk away. <laughs> Perfect. It's so crazy. The it's so good. I, love, I think that I, I think that um 
from from what I learned, I think that was something that actually happened. Like that was like a thing that man gleaned really? from. Like it was they were on a stakeout and there was a noise and the cr- criminal whoever they were following um was like, you know, we walk away. And when they walk away, they don't steal anything, even though they broke into something. Vincent like, but well, we, we can't arrest them for breaking and entering. But then they what? They go to jail for a few months. It's like, yeah. you know, it's like we need to see them do something crazy, like steal something or shoot something, you know, like not just breaking into something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, of yeah, course, Vincent, as he's going to walk. He's going to walk. <laughs> <laughs> he's so mad, so furious. He's going to walk. God. <laughs> oh, man. Fucking funny. But they get away. I mean, for the time being. And so now, at this point, Macaulay and his team know that the LA, they're hot, basically, right? They that, know that they're being followed by someone. Right. And they've been being followed for a while now. And that's when they go to the, uh, the like, giant container place, right? The, <laughs> yeah, the container. Yeah, the container. Oh, my scene. God. Like another great what scene. What a brilliant scene. Beautiful scene. What a beautiful scene. So smart. <laughs> Yeah, they get uh, Macaulay and his yeah Macaulay and his crew. They go to this thing and they're like pointing and they're like hanging out. And of course, on their tails, the LAPD. And then they leave and then they're and then the LAPD go where they were. And they're like, huh, okay, this is kind of weird. Like, what are they gonna do here? There's nothing around here. And then Vincent puts it together and he's like, oh, you know what they're looking at? <laughs> they're looking at us. <laughs> and they show like Macaulay taking pictures of all of them. You know, they've been made. You know, now they have been. Yeah, <laughs> great scene so oh good. when God. it's revealed to you it's perfect it's, it's beautiful uh, it's a beautiful just like you know just you know it's just a beautiful cat and mouse criminal versus cop thing where it's just they one up each other you know they're just they're they're going back and forth and it's just it's just the most ideal film for that it's so good it's it's one of my favorite mo- moments in the movie and honestly so funny just one of those moments that just like hits you like a train you're like oh fuck and it one of the most brilliant things about the scene is it starts off like a close up of a guy taking photographs. And of course he's taking photographs of our, you know, criminal organization. Yeah, and yeah. at the very end of the scene, it's Robert De Niro Macaulay taking yeah. photographs of the police. It's just such a great, like the arc of the scene is just absolutely brilliant. And oh so my God, it's just so good. It's so good. Yeah, incredible. So fucking good. And yeah, you know, basically right after that, you know, you get the scene, I think, where yeah, like Vincent and Macaulay, they have a coffee. You get that great scene. You get that great moment where like I think what Vincent hits on the highway and he finds out where Macaulay is and he's driving. Mm-hmm. And I love that scene where they're driving around where he's driving around and he pulls Macaulay over and he's like, Hey, we should go get coffee. Um, and he's and Macaulay's like, uh, okay. And they go to a diner and they have that great powerful scene one of the greatest just just a gentlemanly conversation just amazing just completely yeah i just i can't say anything i can't it's great <laughs> like <laughs> it's such an absolutely incredible scene and of course you see this in movies all the time where kind of like you know the bad guy and the good guy and they're face to face and you don't know what they're yeah. going to do, but there's kind of like this calm, collected moment. And I think it's interesting that at this moment, Vincent is at his most calm. And I think it's because for Vincent, the reason like he's always so like high and just all over the place, it's never like when he's like in the moment, you know, it's always like something went wrong, either in his life or you know, at the police department, something that's out of his control. But like whenever he's actually like in control of something, he's much more calm, cool and collected. And you see at this moment, like just how calm both of them are. And they have this conversation of really in many ways, idolizing each other and kind of impressed with each other because yeah, they recognize at this moment that in many ways, what they do is very much the same. Like neither of them can mm-hmm. keep a family life neither of them can really do anything other than what they do. Like they're obsessed with what they do and they can't do anything else. Like this is just, it's who they are. It's everything that they are. And mm-hmm. because of that, <clears throat> they struggle to be happy whenever they're not doing that and to kind yeah. of, you know, 
move away from it, right? Whether you're a police officer or a thief feels almost impossible. And so what's so strange about these two characters, especially when they meet, is you realize that in many ways, these are kind of the same character. They have the same ones. They have the same desires. They're basically the same, yeah. They're very The only difference is, right, they're just on opposite ends of the spectrum, right? One's a thief and one's a cop, but otherwise... There's almost no, like, yeah, there's, like, very little distinction between the both of them, which is why the movie is so good. You know, like, you know, it just, and, and I love it too. You know, they, they, they kind of will not explicitly sing too much. You know, they do like ha- sort of make a connection that like, they're both pretty similar, but they do have an understanding that if, it, if, 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 you know, they get pushed, you know, they will, they will kill each other, you know, that they'll kill, I'll, I'll kill you if I have to, you know, even though yeah. I don't really hate you, I don't. I have nothing like all that against you personally, but if I have to kill you, I will not hesitate. Um, just to make, and that's kind of where their conversation leaves off. <laughs> Incredible to just two of the greatest actors of all time, you know, just on, you know, that's it. You know, it's just two of our, our greatest, finest actors, you know, they haven't been in, you know, each of them have been in their fair share of bad movies, but, you know they're they're kind of laying their career in this one even though the movie is now almost 30 years old yeah. um and they they but they just they're so good they're just at the top of their game you know just 100 percent um and i feel like this is the first time they've been on screen together too at that point in time in 1995 i think i i think that's what i heard i think I'm you're right sure. i'm not I think they've been in movies since then, of course. I mean, like The Irishman is a recent example. Um, but in terms of, well, Al Pacino and Robert De Niro, of course, were in the Godfather movies, but they right. never interacted with each other. Right. But I think this is the first time that they have. That It was the first time. Insane. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah. And then I think after that, um, I think Vincent meets with his crew, right? And they're like, he got away, <laughs> you know, like they're, they're basically in the dark. Like they've basically been had once again, um, Macaulay disappears and a bunch of people disappear. Um, I think before they meet with Hank Azaria, uh, the, uh, um, the guy who is, um, ch- who is sleeping with, uh, Val Kilmer's wife, <laughs> um, Hank Azaria, by the way, he's the, um, He's a, he's the most notable for being a uh, a um, voicing several characters on The Simpsons. Really, um, many Did I characters, know that? yeah, many many different characters on The Simpsons since the beginning. <laughs> um, and he's also in movies. Um, yeah, that the guy who's sleeping with Val Kilmer's wife. Yeah. Oh, um, and yeah, they had that great scene where he's like, you know, like. <laughs> why am i mixed up with it and he's like because you got your head all the way up you know just you know like classic scene classic line very out of nowhere totally weird kind of strange you know she's got a great head, you know um and he's useless i think he turns out to be mostly useless um so yeah they're kind of like uh what do we do fuck you know um and i think now they're going to be at this point they're basically building up to the bank robbery where Macaulay and his guys are getting together trying to figure it out Mm -hmm. yeah and Macaulay and his team obviously they all know that they've been had they all know that the police are hot on their tracks and they're like look it may be better just like split you know just yeah call it quits leave drop it move but of course they're all junkies for their craft I mean for most of them it really isn't about the money right it's it's about the thrill of it and so, you know, they decide to kind of go all in on this. And of course, while this is happening, I guess it's important to mention that yeah, the uh, investor guy played by John Voight, he is still really pissed off and knows that he's probably going to be killed soon. So he meets with Wayne Grow. Oh, you're thinking of, uh, no, you're thinking of... Um... Van Zandt, not John Voight. Yes, sorry. Yes, Van Zandt meets with uh, Wayne Grow. Yep. And he's like, I want you to kill these people because otherwise I'm going to get killed. And of course, yeah. Wayne Gro- when Wayne Grow, you know, he's kind of playing his own end. He's like, yeah, I'm yeah. definitely going to kill these people because now he's going to get paid for people he 
probably hates and you know he's a crazy person at this point so yeah. <laughs> he he's off doing that and the crew's together they're at the diner and one of the four main crew members the driver basically calls in and says like hey i can't like i can't do it like the cops are all yeah, over trejo. me play by trejo yeah. play by danny trejo i like that his name is trejo and he's danny trejo whatever yeah he's like yeah i can't do it and this is like the day of the actual thing go. right so it's like oh shit like we need a last minute thing and another thing that we didn't talk yes. about which is well, this is well yeah it's like don don the guy who works at the restaurant they see yeah. him at the restaurant yeah they need a driver they see don there and of course you know this movie is almost like three hours long but i think it's the mm-hmm. it's the perfect link because it flushes out every single character the very well including yeah. the character of don who's played by uh you know the guy with the deep voice um <laughs> dennis haysbert dennis haysbert mm-hmm. and you know he he's working at this diner and earlier in the movie, he like is like an ex-con. He's trying to get a job. He gets a job. The guy, the manager at the at the store, played by the guy who plays Harold and Harold and Maude, he's like an asshole. <laughs> he's like a super big asshole. And you know, you can tell that Don is like, he doesn't want to work at this shitty diner with this guy. And he, I think it's like his wife or girlfriend is like, you know, we, it's okay, you know, Mm -hmm. and all that stuff is really developed. And it's like, oh man, you know, he's frustrated and McCauley, he sees him and he goes up to him and he's like, Hey, I have a job to do right now. And you would be paid millions of dollars if you do it. Do you want to do it? Or do you want to keep working here at the diner? (laughs) He's like, you know what? (laughs) No, (laughs) it's great. It's incredible. I love that whole thing and michael mann's just obsession with characters because he could have easily just had that scene and like not have anything else about don and everyone would have been like that's fine like he knew him for something a little bit more half-baked or something yeah yeah like they could have just easily been like oh i was in prison with them and let's go right you just need that diner scene and you really Mm -hmm. like you could not have those other scenes and the film would still work but the fact that he spends like 20 minutes on this character that really until that point you really don't know how he's connected to anyone else. Like, it's very unclear what his connection is. He's just like this guy. Yeah. You're like, who the hell is this guy? And to have that moment where you're like, oh, shit. Like, it's all kind of like comes together. Yeah. It's just, it's brilliant. It's really just because he was, really I mean, thoughtful. yeah, it's one of those things too. And some people might say it's convenient, but I don't think it's like a convenient plot thing. I think it's more just kind of like a, like kind of once again, kind of like the spiritual, like the universe is trying to say something kind of thing. That's kind of the thing that I think that Michael Mann is really trying to say. Like some people mm-hmm. might be like, oh, McCauley, like he's at this diner and he lost his one guy and a guy that he knows happens to be there. Oh, how convenient. I don't, I don't see it that way. I think I see it as more just kind of like, kind of like the universe aligning in a weird way. And sometimes it just does, you know, some people might say it's convenient, but I find it very um, interesting. And I find it kind of like, it sort of has kind of like this just undiscernible kind of unexplainable quality to it um, when stuff like that happens in Michael Mann movies and especially this one. That's just how it works out. And so, and like you said, it's okay because you also see Don's like, you know, ensuing incidents and events that have led up to this moment. And then <clears throat> after that, you know, the crew is together and you get the bank robbery scene, which is basically like, I would say like the center of mm-hmm. the movie it's basically like the event that ties everyone together um and yeah really kind of kind of it's just kind of the it's the climax of the movie you know yeah in many ways it's kind of the first moment where all of these different characters who you've seen kind of on their own with family members with all these different people they're finally coming together You've been waiting for basically this big event for the whole film. And we're here. Mm -hmm. We're ready. They run into the bank. The actual bank robbery scene itself, like the actual robbing of the bank, isn't actually that much screen time. It's probably like four or five minutes. Like it's a pretty simple, short scene. They basically just walk into the bank, steal the stuff and leave. And I think that's for a three-hour movie to have, you know, the biggest robbery of the film be like a little tiny portion of it is brilliant like i love it like they could have easily spent like 
30, 45 minutes mm-hmm. inside the bank, which but the professionals are really good. They're got to get yeah, in and exactly. Out, you know? They're they just like hinger. in and out, just like that, and it's great. And like most of the bank robbery scene is just people walking around, and yet it's so tense. It's just like them, like just walking around, and no one's like getting shot, no one's getting fired at. They're just yeah, no walking. one gets killed in the bank, <laughs> and yet you're like, well, no you one feels so tense. Yeah, <laughs> right in yeah. the bank. Yes, within the bank. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Like you said, they, they, they get their stuff and they leave and they get in the car with Don and basically right when they leave the bank to get in the car with Don, um, you know, a little bit before that LAPD gets a tip from Van Zandt's bodyguard played by Henry Rollins. Uh, they get the, they get the, uh, they get the tip from it and they're like, Oh shit, we got to go now. No, no, no. And so they go to the bank. So the LAPD basically intercept with McCauley and his crew, right. When they're about to leave or are leaving. Um, and you just get just this massive shootout, just this crazy shootout, loud, you know, just, you know, McCauley and his crew, they got machine guns, you know, the LAPD, all they have is tiny pistols and they all get like just destroyed, you know, well, except uh, Vincent, Vincent yeah. somehow <laughs> has like these like giant ass guns. He's got like shotguns, yeah, 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 he's got yeah, like yeah. machine guns insane yeah like the re- the regular <laughs> cops the non-detective cops they just have like little pistols and they just get <laughs> destroyed like all these cops get killed um uh there's like great uh, footage that i saw recently of um uh-huh. of uh members of the cast including robert de niro all these people they got weapons training and so there's like a video of robert de niro just going crazy in the shooting range he's like hitting all the targets with like a machine gun and stuff like he's crazy um and I know in that scene too, you know, it's like really loud because I think they, and, and I think what they did was that um, it's really loud because like on the street that they're on, they're like, just like basically like trapped in like this kind of like between two big tall buildings. And so yeah. like the sound of the guns kind of reverberate. And I think they were going to include just like other audio for it. But I think Michael Mann specifically wanted the audio that was taken at the, at the um, scene when they shot it oh, shit. Um, for it. So it's like really, really loud, like almost like ear piercingly loud, how, how loud, like all the gunshots are. It's so violent and yeah, it's just, it's just, yeah, it's so strong. I mean, honestly, one of the best shootouts I've ever seen. It's so What's good. so great about this shootout is again, we've talked about this again and again, but just how realistic it feels. And like when someone gets shot, like it really feels like they're getting shot. It's not. You know, one of those things where it's just like a guy standing in the middle of the road, you know, just firing. I mean, you know, good for you and all those kind of action movies of the early and late 80s in which it's just like a guy with a machine gun just like mowing down people. And that's fine. And it has its place. But what I love about this is like everyone's moving very tactically. Like it feels like an yeah. actual shootout. Like everyone's like hiding behind shit. The way and- that the cars are, you can tell all that stuff is laid out very tactically in terms of like, mm-hmm. you know, direction and stuff like that. Absolutely. And like the way your the main crew moves, like one will shoot while the others kind of like move around. And it's like very like succinct and in place and all planned. And of course, the cops are a lot more chaotic and they're just kind of all over the place. But I mean, even like the little thing where often when Macaulay or any of his other criminal masterminds are shooting, they'll kind of turn around mm-hmm. and shoot behind them, too, because they're coming. Yeah, right? The cops yeah. are coming from like, both yeah. directions. It's great. Yeah. Yeah, Val Kilmer especially, like he's going nuts. He's like, yeah, shooting in both directions. Um, of course, it's tragic. You know, Don gets killed very early on. Immediately. Uh, yeah, and and McCauley and Val Kilmer, they're able, Val Kilmer, Chris, Chris and um, McCauley, they're able to get away. They're able to steal a car in the uh, grocery store parking lot, uh, which <laughs> that, that seems crazy. That seems like scary when they're like running around the parking lot and like shooting off and like there's like people, That's that part is scary. Um, and Tom Sizemore, he runs in a different direction and, um, he like gets a, he takes a kid to potentially use as a hostage, but Vincent, you know, he's good. He perfect shot, right. Perfect shot right in the head, you know, gets him. He's out for the count. Um, yeah, but an amazing shootout scene, you know, just one of the greatest scenes, um, of all time, you know, just one of the greatest, most powerful shootouts, just it hits so hard every time you watch it. Um, there's something about it. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, I think after this point, uh, Macaulay is basically now angry. He wants to find out what is going on. 
Um, and of course, Vincent, of course, is still on the same path too to try to find Macaulay and Chris and stop them. Um, so I think Macaulay, like he basically goes on a little tour, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where he's visiting um, all the different people. I think he visits uh, Trejo, right? Yeah. Yeah, and he gets there and it's just a big mess. <laughs> yeah, he of course is under the belief that Trejo has betrayed them because he's the only one that wasn't there. And he walks into the house and you see kind of a, a dead woman or really you don't see the dead woman. You kind of see like her feet, maybe yeah. like a little bit of the, a dead woman. And then you see Trejo and the makeup on Trejo is just like, it's fucking incredible. Like his face just looks absolutely pummeled. He's got like his teeth are all like black and gross and he's got like blood all over yeah, his face. Looks, it's fucking disgusting. Awful, yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and i think he tells them that he'd like wayne grow and um, van sant basically had to do with the botch stuff and he mm -hmm. tells him to shoot him because he's suffering and so yeah now mccully is once again like okay i gotta get wayne grow and i gotta get van zant um i do not like these people um <laughs> and uh and uh um and so I think what happens is, is that, yeah, like uh, Macaulay, I think he, he goes to Van Zandt and he kills him too, right? Yep. Yeah, that's the other thing Macaulay does. Kills him. Although that scene, he throws like a chair and he kills him. And then I think uh, Vincent, who's very intelligent, uh, is like, wait a minute. He's like putting it together and he's realizing that like, okay, Wangro and Macaulay are connected. So I think Macaulay wants to get Wangro. Um, so, and we know that Wangro is at a hotel. How about we, because they beat up Henry Rollins, they beat him up. Mm -hmm. So they're like, okay, well, let's set up like, let's not get Wingro, let's set up like, um, um, you know, officers there to check out his hotel. So they'll be ready when McCauley comes because they think that he might come to get him. So they're like, okay. And so after that, I think um, um, you get uh, McCauley, I think, um, you know, connecting with Edie and then you also get the other part of the movie too where they use where the cops use John not uh use um Val Kilmer's wife too so you get those mm -hmm. two scenes as well yeah which we haven't talked much about this but one of kind of the big plot points of this film is the relationships our protagonists our different characters have with their significant other of course you see Al Pacino arguing with his wife a lot and yeah, you know, all that yeah. shit that goes down and you see this with Val Kilmer's character too. Yeah, they argue a lot. And she's basically as we talked about earlier, she's been sleeping with someone else, but she's simultaneously terrified of dying and going to jail. Mhm. Mm but she also loves her husband, but then she also yeah, has her yeah. kid who she wants to protect and so there's all these kind of conflicting things. And the police officer basically says, like, look, if you don't cooperate with us, like your kid's going to be in foster care, which is yeah. <laughs> pretty, pretty dark. So yeah, and she's like, oh, fuck. So she does it. She cooperates and she goes and stands on the balcony. Yeah. And she all she has to do is like identify that it is him. Mm -hmm. But she sends a signal to Val Kilmer. Um. And she's like, yeah, that wasn't him. Um, and of course, for some reason, just because I think just because once again, you know, I don't think it's a convenience. I just think like these things happen. They're like, yep, it's not him. <laughs> it's not Chris. <laughs> <laughs> they like stop him. They're like, I love that reveal where it's like, yep, that wasn't him. And then the cop uh, is like, uh, can you like uh, stop him? Like a uh, traffic stop? Yeah. It's like, you're like, oh, shit. What the fuck? Uh, everybody's in trouble. But no, they're just like, it's not him. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense, right? He would have fake documentation. He'd have all that stuff. So yeah, I yeah. buy it. I'm, I mean, you know, you don't know what's going to happen at that moment, or you don't know if he's going to get shot or mm -hmm. what. And honestly, him leaving is perhaps one of the most tragic ways for it to go because yeah. another incredible line of this film, Val Kilmer says, you know, she's my sunrise and my sunset. Again, absolutely beautiful. But to him, he's, I mean, he's lost everything. Yeah. This is 
his wife yeah. and child but is he, everything to him. He's the only he's the only criminal that lives. He's the only criminal yeah. that walks away. He doesn't he 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 doesn't get killed. Um, as we will reveal, everybody else gets killed. But he, like you said, it doesn't really matter if he lives or dies. You know, he kind of has to leave his family, um, mm-hmm. and he's a fugitive basically. Um, yeah. So that's the end. Yeah, the whole Val Kilmer arc and character is just you know once again another thread in this giant tapestry of a movie that is just incredible just really well done just very Mm -hmm. solid simple but very effective and emotional and powerful um yeah and then uh, you know alongside that you get macaulay basically Edie finds out that macaulay is like a a horrible criminal not a horrible criminal but he's a criminal and they kind of have a fight but Edie kind of comes to terms with it and she's like okay that's fine um i love you a lot and you know maybe we can run away and try to you know figure out something for ourselves and like okay and so you know that's kind of what they decide to do they decide that they're going to just kind of they have basically everything that val kilmer has right like they basically have like enough money and stuff to be able to drive away um which is what they're going to do um alongside that you have uh i think uh vincent dealing with his wife who cheated on him so he's upset about that (laughs) There's yep. a whole scene where I love that scene where, of course, once again, another hilarious, great scene where he finds out his wife cheated with this guy and the guy is there. And he's like, look, you know, I don't care that you cheated. You you had sex with my wife, but you don't watch my TV. And he like, <laughs> like, he's like, he's like, he like takes the TV and he like throws it around and stuff. He's like upset about it. You don't watch my TV. Um, And then, and, and then of course, you know, he, he, he has to deal with his, um, a stepdaughter who basically almost kills herself. Yeah. She, I mean, basically after the scene with Val Kilmer, the team basically tells Vincent that, or Vincent's convinced that he got away. It's over. It's done. Like there's nothing we can do. Yeah. He's pissed off. Late. Yeah. And him leaving at that moment is just, kind of insane because he spent this whole film you know, he's basically spent his whole life right looking for these people and he's he feels like he's failed he gives up yeah and he goes to his hotel and of course he finds his stepdaughter uh having bathtub. just right in the bathtub having just uh slit uh, slit her wrist her wrist yeah and the arteries on her legs too and mm-hmm. there's this whole long scene well, kind of long, where even though, you know, Macaulay's on the run, he's going to get away. I think this moment's really powerful because Vincent throws away all that. Like, you think this whole film, like, Vincent, sure, he cares about his family and all that shit, but, like, at the end of the day, he's always going to go for Macaulay. But at this moment, it kind of shows that he genuinely cares so much for his family and his stepdaughter. And you're know, going yeah. to the hospital, being with them, and you're know, saying, you know, I don't give a shit about any of this stuff. Like, this is what matters. This is what's important. And him just being there in that moment is intense. Yeah, yeah. Like, he rushes. They rush to the hospital. And, you know, he's very, like, receptive to the fact that, like, she's hurt. And, you know, and, and then his wife comes. And, you know, they kind of have a moment where they're just kind of like, you know, like, despite our problems, you know, we can try to make it work out. You know, they seem to have like a moment of understanding over this like crazy event where she, their, her daughter almost died. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But after that, um, um, I think uh, yeah, Vincent gets a call, right? Too. Yeah, because yeah, Macaulay, despite the fact that he can go he has everything that he would ever yes, need it's such a it's such a good yes he he can't do it he can't he can't help himself he can't, he can't, he can't help, help himself. himself i love that scene where he's driving with Edie, and they go mm-hmm. in the tunnel and it's like really bright white and you yeah. get that great robert de niro moment where they like it's his face and his face like the way he kind of like moves his face around you can mm-hmm. tell that something's kind of like eating him up right mm-hmm. like it's like he's a he's with it like the love of his life his girlfriend they have everything they need. They can do anything. They can go anywhere. But Robert De Niro, he can't help himself. He knows where Wingro is. And so he takes the exit and he he's gonna go to the hotel to get Wingro. He can't help himself. 
it's such a it's so sad it's so sad i mean the just the juxtaposition of him going into that tunnel right the idea of kind of this bright white light like an almost heaven of sorts like he's finally done it you know he's finally getting away he's good he's safe and the fact that he can't do it he's just Mm -hmm. for whatever reason you know whether you call it loyalty or just his addiction to crime or revenge or whatever i mean this is the beginning of really your tragic fall of macaulay and it's yeah it only goes down from here (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, like, it almost kind of also, it almost kind of goes against kind of what his principles are too, right? Like, he mm-hmm. he just like, he kind of really, in this moment, even though he doesn't really do it too often, he does act an impulse. You know, he, he kind of goes the way that doesn't really, because it, it kind of, it's almost kind of like um with the, um it, you know, it's kind of, kind of goes back to the scene where um they're, they're stealing the medals, you know, and that moment right away, right when he knew there was trouble, he left, you know, he didn't, he wasn't like, oh, we're gonna, you know, he left right away. And in this situation, there's definitely probably something wrong if he goes to try to kill Wayne Grow. But once again, he can't help himself. But no, not once again. In this instance, he can't help himself, you know, mm-hmm. and it's his demise. Yeah. And his whole hotel adventure, murder mm-hmm. of Wayne Grow. Great scene. It's it's Incredible. really like yeah it's yeah it's just it's you know so once well again, thought out yeah it's just it, it's very it's pretty it's not like the the best scene in the movie or anything but in itself mm-hmm. it's just a fantastic scene <laughs> yeah I mean just like goes every and, yeah yeah like every little step it's just like these tiny little things like he walks in through the like uh, maintenance area or like you know where housekeepers yeah, yeah. are and stuff he goes. He calls, he figures out what room he's in by pretending he's room service. The way, you know, he walks through the hotel, he goes up the elevator, he stops the elevator door by using the trash can. He pulls the fire alarm, knowing that all the elevator is going to go down and that the stairs are going to be like, he knows that the cops are there. He knows everything that's going on. The way he goes to the room, right? He stands with his back to the door. So he looks like a security guard. He even has the flashlight and he's like moving it around. It's just every single little detail is just so meticulous and there's no reason it needs to be this meticulous. Like you could take out half of those details and you'd be like, that's fine. Like you'd yeah, still enjoy crazy. the film. But the yeah. fact that Michael Mann put so much thought into every he has to have a way this. to get inside. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. incredible. Yeah. And of course, you know, and it, and it leads to the most simplest conclusion where all he does is just burst into Wayne Grove's apartment and he shoots him in the face. He just shoots like, him. <laughs> that's it. You know, like he just shoots him and then he's able to evade the cops and then he's able to get outside. And it's hilarious too. By the time he gets outside, there's tons of emergency vehicles and fire trucks and police cars. And, mm-hmm. you know, at this point he's fucked himself. And in that moment, you know, Vincent is there, I think. Yeah. And Macaulay and Vincent yeah. are there and Macaulay has to do the most difficult thing, which is that he has to like walk away from Edie. Like he has to just say like, that's it, you know? And it's a very sad moment where they kind of look at each other as they walk away and McCauley walks the other direction of Edie. Um, and it's, it's sad. It sucks. You know, it's like, cause you want, you don't want McCauley. You like McCauley, you know, you want him to get away. But mm-hmm. once again, you know, in this instance, he couldn't help himself. And then of course you get that great chase scene where Vincent is chasing Macaulay um, across basically the Los Angeles International Airport. Another mm-hmm. great scene. Just another fantastic shit. So incredible. I mean, that moment where he's standing at the door and you can, right, you can hear it in your mind. I mean, I know they don't say it, but like you can hear that line that Macaulay says so many times in this film. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And he's, right, he's literally faced with this moment. Yeah. He almost and when he it, leaves, but he does it. I mean, I just, it's just so hard because I even think it's really, it's not even really about Edie. It's just that. Edie just kind of represents, Edie almost kind of like represents like, like kind of like a hopefulness mm-hmm. of for Macaulay, right? A hopefulness for him to kind of like not have to do this crazy shit anymore. And he can kind of walk away, but he can't help yeah. himself. It's such a, uh, it hits hard. And I thought, uh, 
it's just so much. And of course that last chase scene, again, so much thought that doesn't necessarily need to be put into a scene where it's just two people chasing after each other. Yeah. Over and, I love I love I love where they're uh chasing. I love where they're running to. Like they're basically just like running around in kind of like this empty area that's not meant for people, you know? Mm-hmm. It's there's something kind of interesting about how they're kind of in this environment that's not for people to be in kind of it's crazy it's so good yeah and you get the final scene where they're at these like cubes you know like whatever Mm -hmm. they are you know just shit i think they're like air conditioners Um, or something something like some kind of like electrical mechanical unit yeah yeah and they're kind of like you know peering around the corners and stuff and you know they're like oh you know like you know he's you know they're playing like this game of chess where you know one of them's trying to bait the other or going around the corner and you have these crate those big los angeles international airport lights and mm-hmm. you know i love to the, the, the other thing about michael mann's movies all of them including this one is that the environment and when i say the environment i don't know i don't just mean like natural elements like a mm-hmm. tree or something like that but like buildings and lights and things like that they almost kind of interact with the movie and what's going on in the movie sort of like they almost kind of i don't know them they they kind of respond to the movie a little bit um yeah like things even if things happen in the background like that aren't related to what's going on in the foreground of the scene for some reason it still kind of like connects to what's happening even though like you could say that you know a light turning on in the background is you know it it doesn't really although i know michael mann has done that where he'll <clears throat> there's like a scene in manhunter where a character mm-hmm. is like in a building and there's another okay. building behind him throughout the window and what michael mann did was that he basically coordinated a w- way at the other building to have the elevator turn on at a certain time so a light would come <sighs> on in the scene in the background of the building as a character is in the other building sitting there so he obviously like thinks about like stuff like that where like the inner environment kind of co- like interacting and co- sort of coordinating with what's happening in the movie itself mm-hmm. unbelievable yeah. and yeah it just amazing ending incredible i mean even the use of simple foreshadowing just a few seconds earlier the first time you kind of see the lights go bright and it goes dark yeah and you're like oh okay and then of course that final moment where the <clears throat> two are about to fire each other right Macaulay comes out of yeah. the hiding spot and vincent see because the lights come up and vincent sees the shadow and just yeah. like that split second, like that's just that tiny little difference. Mm-hmm. Macaulay's the one that dies. I mean, he's the one that yeah. uh, doesn't get away. Insane. Yeah. And I just love that scene where, yeah, like Al Pacino's like, you know, uh, Vincent, he's like looking up in the sky. I think a plane is taking off or landing and they play that great. Um, I don't care much for him, but they, they do play that really great Moby song. Um, God moving over the face of the waters. Um, which is a beautiful, great music, by the way. Michael Mann, crazy dude. Like he, in all of his movies, he really utilizes like electronic and ambient instrumentation, uh, like tracks and music and score a lot in all of his movies, which is amazing. Um, And it always works out really well. And in this movie, especially, it works out really well. And yeah, that final shot with the music and, you know, just everything about it is just, it's so impactful. What a film. Iconic. Yeah. <laughs> well, Andrew, final thoughts and rating? Yes, sir. Of course, you know, I've got to give it up for my man, Michael Mann. He's sick. Great director, great writer. It's just a perfect movie. I'm not going to talk too much about it in this final thoughts because I think we said everything I needed to say. Uh, perfect movie, 10 out of 10. Every time I watch it, I... I think I connect with it more and more each time I watch it. Absolutely. Yeah. Honestly, coming into this film, I was hesitant because like I've said, action's never really been my thing personally. But yeah, describing it as action is maybe not. Yeah, correct. it's not really an action. More like movie. a crime drama. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, in many ways, it's a it's really a character study in a lot of ways, more yeah. than anything else. And just from the moment it begins, I mean, just the editing, the visuals, the sound design, everything about it is just so on point. And of course, the performances, as we talked about, are just, just absolutely insane. Yeah. I think my only real complaints, if I have any, is Edie as a character, compared to perhaps all the other characters, maybe this is the only reason why, doesn't feel fully fleshed out. Now, maybe that's just because we get so much of everyone else. I would have liked to seen a little more with her. I think the few scenes that he has with her I don't know. I think I'm very interested in the premise and the idea of, you know, him looking for hope and Edie kind of representing that, but I don't know. There was just something about that that just felt a little off. Maybe there just wasn't enough of it. Maybe there just wasn't enough of Edie in the film. I don't know. And, may, and I'm not saying it needs more of Edie, but just something about that relationship. And it's really not even about the relationship, I guess. It's just the interactions between the two maybe I just want more. I don't know. And maybe on a rewatch, I would get that. But otherwise, my only other complaint is after Macaulay walks away from the car, I think the film should just end right there. Like he walks away from Edie. And maybe I just don't want to see him die. Like maybe I just like the idea of kind of having no, like an open-ended conclusion. Yeah. I mean, I love the ending. The chase scene's great, as all the chase scenes are. But I almost like the idea, because at that point, like, after he runs away, it really doesn't matter if De Niro lives or dies. It's kind of like Val Kilmer's character. Like, once he leaves, whether he lives or dies doesn't really matter. Now, maybe it's a little different for Macaulay, but for me, that was the ending right there. It's right when he walks away. I mean, it's so heartbreaking. And maybe I just want, like, the idea of, like, I don't know, like this world could continue to exist, that Macaulay as a character can continue to exist. But otherwise, what a spectacular film. I was truly blown away. I'm going to give this a very high 9 out of 10. Let's go. <laughs> all right, all right y'all. Thank you for listening. To find more exclusive content and early access, go to patreon.com slash life through fiction. That's patreon.com slash life through fiction. And you can find anything I do at Austin Lugo one two. <clears throat> you can find me on Twitter at adharp twenty four. I'm also on Letterboxd at Retro Andrew R E T R zero Andrew. And you can find this podcast wherever you find podcasts. You can also find us on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and Letterboxd at With Nothing to Say Pod. And thank you all for listening. Thank you again. <laughs>